symbols. We see them everywhere. On traffic signs, on logos, on our phones. Even hand gestures are a kind of symbol. But have you ever wondered where all these universal squiggles and swoops come from? Well, allow me to act as your humble cryptographer as we decode everything from ancient at signs to confusing controller buttons. These are the secret origins of everyday symbols. Three points. Be honest, how many times have you tried to plug in a USB only to flip it over and over, struggling to figure out which way it plugs in? Oh man, is it humbling. But what's even more humbling is seeing that weird little trident symbol on the port and having no idea what it's meant to be. The circle, square, and triangle. It's like they're mocking me. What do they mean? Well, the three-pronged USB symbol was modeled after Dryzak. For those who missed that history lesson, that's the name of the trident wielded by Poseidon, the ancient Greek god of the sea. The three shapes at the trident's points are there to signify the variation in peripherals that can all be connected via a universal serial bus, or USB. As such, the trident was designed to symbolize the technological power USBs have, being able to connect a wide range of other devices. Finally, I know what it means! I still won't be able to plug it in on the first try, though. Arch Enemies If you hold up your index and middle fingers, it can mean a number of different things. It can be a sign of peace, a symbol of victory, or a very rude gesture in the UK, depending on which way round the fingers are held. But the inception of this two-fingered salute is believed to be older and more gruesome than most Brits realize. At least one meaning of the gesture traces its origins back to the Hundred Years' War, which was fought over 116 years, pretty aptly named there, between France and England. The legend states that during this conflict, the French would remove the middle and index fingers of English longbowmen they captured before returning them, as a man without these fingers was useless as an archer. It's said that during this time, boastful English longbowmen who weren't captured would raise their two fingers defiantly, essentially saying, look, I can still fight. While pretty badass, this may just be a legend. English longbows were famously larger and harder to wield than other bows. Most soldiers needed to use three fingers in order to pull back on the string, meaning it would make more sense for the gesture to include the ring finger as well as the middle and index making it closer to a Boy Scout salute. Of course, you could also argue that if the bows needed three fingers to wield, chopping off two was as good as chopping off three. Whether true or not, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill played a large role in repopularizing the gesture towards the start of the Second World War back in 1941. Around this time, he was first photographed flashing the V shape with his fingers, which soon became the Allied sign for victory. As V was the first letter in victory, not only in English, but also in French and Flemish, the main languages of Britain's non-English speaking allies. He would occasionally flip it around, assumedly to send a message to their enemies. One probably meaning, Roy, look here, we can still fight by Jove, but in more colorful language. Control issues. All right, one for all the console gamers watching. You might be so good at gaming that you can speedrun Dark Souls in less than 30 minutes or thrash all of your friends and even the pros in Call of Duty. But can you tell me what the symbols on the buttons on a PlayStation controller mean? Yeah, the circle, square, X, and triangle. You use them all the time, but what do they mean? The answer to this question was supposedly figured out by nerds a while back. The buttons on the Sony controller appear to refer to the Mario franchise. Specifically, they're the shapes Magic Koopa enemies shoot from their wands in the classic Super Mario World games. See? Wait, play that again. There's no X. The Magic Koopa only shoots out a triangle, circle, and square. Those sparkles aren't Xs. And you can see this clearly in official art of the characters. Loads of people still believe this misconception, though. The actual rationale behind the buttons is a little more convoluted. According to Sony's Taiyu Goto, who chose the symbols, Sony wanted their controller to stand out from their competitors at Sega and Nintendo, who used lettered buttons. 
Goto decided on easy-to-recognize shapes, each of which had a meaning. The triangle is at the top because it points upwards. The square represents a piece of paper or document, as Sony believed this button would be used mostly for menus. The circle and X buttons represent yes and no, or confirm and deny, respectively. This is where some cultural confusion comes into play. In Japan, a circle and a cross takes the place of a tick and a cross in the West. This meant that in many early PlayStation games, the inputs of the circle and cross were switched. In Japan, you press circle to confirm, whereas in the West, it was X. It's only on the fifth PlayStation that Sony has made X the confirm button in Japan. If I were a Japanese gamer, I'd really push my buttons. You know what buttons you should be pushing, though? Those like and subscribe ones right down below. Now that that cheesy and unavoidable joke is out of the way, what have we got next? Toyota Cypher. Car manufacturer Toyota's symbol is simple, easy to recognize, and honestly, a little confusing. I mean, cars have four wheels, and yet their logo is three circles? What gives? While the logo was chosen way back in 1936 and wasn't designed in-house. Instead, it was the winner of a logo design competition, and it beat out 46,000 other entries. While the circles may seem random, individual elements from the design can be separated from the others in order to spell out the word Toyota. T-O-Y-O-T-A. Pretty nifty, huh? I bet you've come back full circle into thinking it's a good logo now. Sorry, sorry. I'll shift gears. I heart you. Have you ever wondered why this weird bumpy upside down triangle is called a heart shape? I mean, have you seen a real heart recently? If your heart were actually shaped like this, there'd be something seriously wrong with you. A more romantic internet theory found all over Pinterest boards and Boomer Facebook posts is that it represents two hearts side by side. Aw, isn't that sweet? It's also completely unfounded and requires a lot of artistic license to claim that this looks like that. So if it doesn't look like a real heart or even two hearts, where does the heart symbol come from? The origin of the shape dates back several hundred years BCE. Back then, there was a popular little plant called silphium. This fennel had heart-shaped bulbs and was found along the North African coast, likely near the city of Cyrene. And the ancient Greeks loved it. Seriously, they were so crazy about this plant, they even put it on some of their coins. Why was this little plant so popular? Well, it had a number of uses, but its most important role was as a form of contraception. Back then, if you wanted to bump uglies without having kids, your options were limited, namely to taking silphium. And so the plant became so popular that it actually went extinct sometime around the second century BCE. Silphium's connotations with sweet lovemaking are perhaps why its distinct shape became synonymous with love and, for poetic license, the heart. This theory has its flaws, though. For starters, the heart shape as we understand it only began popping up in art from the 1250s onwards, over a thousand years after the extinction of silphium. That gap is pretty hard to explain. Other theories posit this shape is meant to resemble a well-endowed chest, a butt, or even male privates, if viewed upside down. Suddenly, I'm way less comfortable getting that valentines from my mom. Bio recognition. You know, for warnings responsible for making sure you don't die, the radiation and biohazard symbols are pretty abstract, aren't they? If I saw the radiation symbol in the wild, I might think it was alerting me to a cool fidget spinner factory nearby. In reality, this symbol warns the viewer of nearby dangerous radioactivity. It was first sketched by members of a Berkeley research group headed by Nels Garden in 1946. The symbol was initially magenta on a blue background as Nels believed the colors were seen less frequently and thus would stand out more. The colors were later switched to magenta on yellow before eventually standardizing as black on yellow as it makes the shapes more clearly discernible from a greater distance. As for the symbol itself, Nels explained that it is meant to represent radioactivity escaping from an atom. Oh my god, that makes so much sense now. Finally, I can stop seeing it as a forbidden fidget spinner. But what about this symbol? Understood universally as the sign of biohazardous materials, the symbol looks like a gothic inkblot test. The symbol itself is simple enough. 
a circle trisected by three black interlocking tendril-like circles that peter out towards the rim. The symbol was created by Dow Chemical Engineers in 1966 and had to adhere to a set of guidelines ensuring the symbol was nondescript and recognizable. The design they came up with broadly suggests the idea of a physical organism being disrupted by a harmful agent. Thinking of it that way it makes a lot of sense. A single element torn apart by a malicious substance. Kind of like me and hot sauce. Hi, Andy. Ah, uh, Hyundai. The makers of modern, cost-effective cars and, if their mock-ups are to be believed, the future makers of weird, drivable Wi-Fi routers. Still, no matter what design Hyundai goes with in the future, we know what logo the car will be sporting. The Hyundai logo works because it's so simple. An italicized H inside a circle. Nothing more to see here, right? Well, don't let Hyundai hear you say that. According to the company themselves, the logo isn't just an H. It's meant to resemble two men shaking hands as viewed from the side. Having trouble? Here's a handy little visual aid. Hyundai state the logo is meant to represent prosperity and the healthy relationship Hyundai has with their customers. Personally, I think they should have positioned the fellas a little closer together. Just look how long those arms are. Blue in the tooth. Ah, Bluetooth, the technology that uses radio frequencies to allow devices to share information wirelessly over short distances. It's truly a game changer. Without it, we'd still be stuck in the dark age of wired headphones, where just putting them in your pocket for a moment would tangle them in a knot so tight it'd make a sailor cry. Looking at the symbol for it, though, you may think it's simply a stylized letter B, but there's actually a lot of meaning hiding in those hard lines. The design draws influence from Nordic runes, the symbols that made up the written language of the Vikings. As the symbols were usually carved into stone or wood, they're entirely comprised of straight lines rather than curves. Imagine trying to carve a perfect circle into a tree, and you'll get it. The Bluetooth symbol is what's called a bind rune, which is two runes combined into one. The two runes making up the Bluetooth bind rune are the Viking equivalents for the letters H and B. These letters pay homage to a legendary Norse king by the name of Harold Bluetooth. Harold's greatest accomplishment was in uniting various disparate Norse peoples under one banner. Kind of like how modern Bluetooth is designed to connect various pieces of tech. Is that a cool backstory? Yes. Is that a huge reach? Also yes. Equals equals equal. Have you ever thought about how much time the equals sign saves you when doing math? Before the advent of the equal symbol, mathematicians would painstakingly write the phrase is equal to every time they wrote out an equation. I know, ain't nobody got time for that. Thankfully, in 1557, along came mathematics superhero Robert Record and his book, The Whetstone of Wit. While working on the book, Record grew tired of writing is equal to over and over again. Unlike other loser mathematicians before him, however, he decided to do something about it by creating the equals symbol. When you hear how he designed it, you'll kick yourself for never noticing it before. Record represented the idea of an equation being equal by creating a sign made of two equal lines. Here's one of the first ever a little longer than nowadays, but he's getting people used to the idea. When placed in the middle of an equation, it's the perfect way of saying, this stuff here is the same as this stuff here. Wow, Record was truly a man with no equal. Bloody Peace When I was a kid, I used to tell my bullies that I, uh, that I was a pacifist, that I didn't believe violence would solve anything, thinking it would protect me. It's so dumb. Oh, it's so dumb, it's brilliant. No! It's just dumb! Anyway, have you ever wondered where this sign comes from? The universal symbol for tree huggers and hippies the world over, the peace symbol is as recognizable as it is confusing. <laughs> I mean, what even is this thing? A circle with some lines? Unlike other cryptic symbols, we actually know when and where this one came from. The Direct Action Committee, or DAC, in 1958. The DAC were opposed to nuclear weapons and created this symbol as a universal sign for nuclear disarmament. 
A popular misconception is that the symbol represents the combined semaphore signs for N and D, or nuclear disarmament. However, this is just a pleasant coincidence. According to Gerald Holtum, a professor of design and member of the DAC, the symbol takes inspiration from the incredibly disturbing painting, 3rd of May 1808, by Francisco Goya. The painting depicts a helpless peasant about to be mowed down by soldiers. According to Holtum, the lines of the symbol represent a dejected man placing their arms out to the side and a display of weary innocence. If you flip the individual in Goya's painting, you can kind of see it. So next time you see a peace sign, remember, it's not a happy-go-lucky symbol. It's a somber reminder of the cost of war. Ons on. If you enjoy channel surfing as much as me, you're probably intimately familiar with this little symbol. The power symbol, or simply the on symbol, is comprised of a circle with a vertical line at the top and adorns TV remotes the world over. The symbol is derived from binary, which is the language of ones and zeros that computers use to relay information across their circuit boards. The power symbol is simply a combination of these two characters, the zero as the base and the one at the top. This makes sense when you think about it. Zero one is, after all, the first combination of these numbers in binary. Hence, zero one represents something starting, beginning, or powering up. If you're curious, you should subscribe to be amazed in binary is 01011001 0110. Uh, that's pretty long. That joke's not worth it. Let's move on. Crowning around. Throughout human history and across multiple cultures, the crown has signified one thing. The person wearing it is the head honcho, the big kahuna, the fat Albert. Okay, not so much that last one, but still. So what gives? Why does wearing a fancy ring around your head mean you get to set my taxes? Well, one theory is that in Christianity, angels are often depicted with halos around their heads. As many kings claim to rule via divine right, i.e. they were appointed by God, the crown could be said to have holy connotations. However, this theory doesn't hold much water. For starters, the widespread precursor to the traditional crown is the diadem. These were worn by Persian monarchs by at least 400 CE. Some Greek gods are depicted wearing them around the same time, and the ancient Egyptians were fashioning diadems by 2465 BCE. Even the world's oldest crown, known as the Copper Age crown, discovered in the Judean desert, was created somewhere between 3200 and 4000 BCE. So diadems, and even crowns themselves, were around long before Christianity. So where does that leave us? Sadly, just with theories. But we might be overthinking it. After all, crowns just make sense. They're made of expensive materials or adorned with jewels most people can't afford, demonstrating wealth. They're also placed on the head so they can be clearly seen by others as well as hinting at a greater power from above. And if they happen to make you look a little taller, well, that's good too. Another theory is that crowns may have evolved from helmets, the most powerful, important people on the battlefield having the sturdiest and most elaborate. Hey, I mercilessly fought off other YouTube channels during my rise to power. Maybe I should wear a crown too. The Bad Thumb Ah, the thumbs up. When used in the real world, it's a gesture of approval. But have you ever wondered why we raise our thumbs to confirm or encourage things? The answer takes us way, way back to the fights in the Colosseums of ancient Rome. When one warrior would best another in gladiatorial combat, they would expectedly turn to face the most important person in attendance, whether it be a city official or the Roman emperor himself. This individual would then make a gesture to indicate the fate of the losing warrior. Thumbs up, it might surprise you to learn, meant death. The thumb is thought to represent the blade and holding it up grimly meant continue. So the thumbs up is an affirmation. It's just less, hey, good job and more, yes, please do murder. So when the loser was spared, it was a thumbs down, right? Well, not exactly. Instead, the official would place their thumb in their other hand as if they were sheathing a blade. It's thought that the thumbs down came into existence because it's more immediate and easier to comprehend. One is the opposite of the other, after all, and we love those sorts of things. So the next time the kid mowing your yard asks if he's done a good job, think twice about giving him the old thumbs up. Yin Yang Tastic. The yin and yang symbols have been around a long time, 
In fact, their first use was dated back in the 14th century BCE. In the 3400 odd years they've been around, the symbols have become strongly associated with Taoism, but also adorn the walls of yoga moms the world over. The symbol itself represents the balance between two complementary forces, each containing a small aspect of the other. This can be linked to many concepts such as morality and spirituality, though the visual has a surprisingly literal origin. That's because yin literally translates to the dark side of the mountain, while yang translates to the light side of the mountain. The symbol can thusly be viewed as a stylized representation of a mountaintop from above. One side shady, the other bright, with inclines and slopes on each side altering the shadows. Dang, yin yang. If only all the other symbols had such literal explanations, my job would be a whole lot easier. Cross with crosses. If you knew a metalhead goth or emo in high school, there's a good chance they sported one of these edgy bad boys, the inverted cross. This little symbol is spray painted on walls, hangs from necklaces, and even adorns the arms of disobedient anti-establishment individuals everywhere. If you've ever wondered where this blatantly anti-Christian symbol comes from, the answer might surprise you, because it's Christianity. That's right, one of the most widely used anti-religious symbols in the world is, in fact, a religious symbol. Specifically, it's the symbol of St. Peter. You know, the guy outside the pearly gates. In real life, Peter is the patron saint of bakers, cobblers, locksmiths, and other professions. He was also one of the Twelve Apostles and, for his troubles, was martyred. How, you might ask? Before his execution at the hands of the Romans, Peter apparently requested to be crucified upside down because he felt unworthy to die the same way Christ did. For most of history, the inverted cross, also known as the Petrine Cross, was in fact not a symbol of defiance, but a mark of devotion and sign of appreciation towards Peter. It was only in the 20th century in the advent of metal music, particularly black metal, that the symbol gained its anti-Christian connotations. Likely, this was just because it makes sense as an act of rebellion to take a holy symbol and turn it upside down. So next time you want to annoy a metalhead, compliment their devotion to St. Peter. P for pie. What do aerospace engineers and bakers have in common? They both talk about pie all day. Thanks, I'm here all week. <laughs> If you don't remember your 10th grade math, pi, represented by this symbol, is equal to about 3.141. As pi can be used to figure out the area and circumference of a circle, along with many of your other circular needs, it's a very important number. Pi's discovery is attributed to Archimedes of Syracuse sometime around 250 BCE, but he didn't create this symbol. For that, we need look no further than 18th century mathematician William Jones. Jones got tired of writing pi out over and over again, so he decided to come up with a shorthand. He settled on the first Greek letter of the word for perimeter, exactly what he was using the number to calculate. If Jones had cared more about the area, maybe we'd know the symbol as alpha today. I'm sure all you math nerds out there would hate that. Percy Buku. The ampersand is a wonderful character. This squiggly little guy can turn any two letters into an iconic brand. For example, H&M, A&W, M&M, A&E. Okay, that last one isn't as fun as the others. Nevertheless, it's a handy way to abbreviate the word and, but it's kind of weird, right? What does this eight with a tail have to do with the word and? Well, a lot more than you might think. The simple story started back in ancient Rome where Latin was the common parlance. In Latin, the word et means and. You may have heard it in the phrase, et tu, brute. That's the ancient equivalent of, don't stab me, bro. As Latin was a language that just refused to die, writers continued to use words and phrases from it long after Rome's fall. The written et evolved over the centuries, with the e and t getting more and more smooshed together, likely to save room on the pages upon which it was written. While the exact date where et morphed into the modern ampersand can't be pinpointed, that's where it came from. Except not really. We may have cracked the case for the symbol, but where the heck does that weird name come from? Ampersand? Is that Latin too? Far from it. In the 1800s, the ampersand was at the height of its popularity, but the symbol was just called and at the time. 
The AND symbol was so common, in fact, that it was often taught in European schools alongside the alphabet as a sort of unofficial 27th letter. When writing the alphabet out, AND would come after Z. Teachers realized pretty quickly, however, that saying X, Y, Z, AND, AND out loud was kind of awkward and didn't make learning letters any easier for kids. So the method for reciting the alphabet became X, Y, Z, AND, PER SE, AND. PER SE means by itself. So the phrase was essentially there for a verbal breather. Over the years, in the mouths of babbling schoolchildren, and per se and eventually morphed into ampersand. Finally, our long winding journey with the ampersand comes to a close. Except not, because there's one more interesting symbol linked to the very same source. Let's zoom in on the word. Notice anything that could be related to any other symbols? Let me point it out. That's right. The origins of the mathematical plus or addition sign can also be linked back to et. The little cross that makes up the symbol is derived from where the E and T meet. Makes sense, as and and plus basically mean the same thing. Before that, mathematicians often just used the letters P and M to denote plus and minus. The symbols we know today were first printed in 1489 and slowly gained in popularity. Okay, I'm done. No more ands, ets, or ampersands, I promise. Just like Mama. You might recognize this smiling face as Wendy, the mascot for Wendy's food chain, who's been happily selling us cheesed potatoes since 1969. She may look like a cartoon, but it turns out Wendy's a real person. No, I haven't been watching too much anime. Mary Lou Thomas, who at the time was a young freckled faced girl with red hair, was the daughter of Dave Thomas. She had trouble pronouncing her L's and R's, which was a problem considering her name contained so many of them, and so her family affectionately called her Wendy. Dave Thomas later established Wendy's Old Fashioned Hamburgers with Wendy's likeness used for the logo. Although, isn't Wendy looking a little old fashioned there? Ah, that's because we're looking at the old logo. Here's the 2013 redesign. It's pretty similar except for one tiny little cryptic message. Can you catch it? Let's zoom in. As many savvy consumers have pointed out, there's a faint, sneakily hidden mom tucked away in Wendy's collar. While Wendy's have stated it's merely a coincidence, others think it's a subtle example of subliminal marketing. Essentially, sneaky advertising that's meant to get in your head without you realizing. The goal? To make you associate Wendy's food with nice home cooking or the warm feeling of love only a mother could provide. My mom was an unfeeling YouTube orb, so sadly, I can't relate. Corny noms. Picture this. You're sat down in the movie theater, the lights dim, and the trailer begins. Desolate vistas. Dramatic music. Aging actors who really want an Oscar win before they kick the bucket in a couple of years. Finally, the name. Be amazed, the movie. You immediately know this is a classy and important film because you keep seeing these... Ears of corn? For some reason, strands of wheat always appear on either side of an award's name. What gives? The Farmers Union can't be that powerful. As with a few other items we've spoken about, this tradition finds its roots in antiquity. In both ancient Greece and Rome, laurel wreaths were placed atop the heads of those considered victorious. Whether you were a champion wrestler or a beloved poet, if you won a competition, you'd be adorned with a bushy wreath. Even Roman emperors did it and they're often seen donning laurel wreaths and sculptures. Why was this the case? Well, in Greek mythology, the god Apollo once fell in love with a nymph, which is kind of like a fairy. The nymph, who clearly only liked Apollo as a friend, turned herself into a tree to avoid him. The tree sprung laurels, which Apollo started wearing. As Apollo was typically seen as a triumphant figure, the connotation stuck. I don't know why, though. Imagine striking out so hard your crush turns themselves into a tree. This is also where the phrase to rest on one's laurels comes from, to rely on past achievements rather than putting in an effort. Today, the laurels are an easy eye-catching way of telling viewers that this is a winner. See you this Christmas for the Be Amazed movie premiere. I still can't believe they cast Vince Vaughn as Mr. Beast. Hidden Chicken If you live in the States, you're probably familiar with Chick-fil-A. Founded in 1946, this fast food chain is just about the only chicken business in the world able to compete with KFC. But its logo is comparatively busy and cryptic. You see, most people are able to spot the rooster proudly adorning the logo C, 
But what you might not realize is that there are four more chickens nestled away in this loopy logo. Seriously, let's look at them one by one. There's the rooster in the C, there's this little guy in the H and I, this one in the K, another in the F and I, and one final, more complete chicken whose beak is found in the capital A. Now, Chick-fil-A has never claimed that this is intentional. In fact, it's downright hard to spot. Maybe I just have chickens on the brain. But I definitely see more chickens than one. Do you? Let me know down in the comments below. To barely roam. We've got to be thankful for Toblerone. Without them, what would dads around the world have received every single Father's Day for the last 115 years? The triangular chocolate bears the logo of Switzerland's iconic Matterhorn. But what if I told you there was something else this logo bears? It's a bear! When you fill in the negative space on the mountain, you can clearly see a silhouette of a bear tucked away inside. This isn't a random inclusion, however. It's a cute reference to the town the Toblerone Company was founded in, Bern, which is nicknamed the City of Bears. They even put this fellow on their coat of arms. The name Toblerone is a portmanteau of the founders' names, Emil and Theodore Tobler, and the Italian word for honey, Torone. Coincidentally, Toblerone also features the letters B, E, R, and N in order. It bears repeating, this logo is very clever. Faithful Fish If you've ever seen a bumper sticker in Midwest America, you're probably aware that this simple fish is a symbol of Christianity. Next to the cross, it's one of the most widely used signifiers of faith. Why though? Was Jesus related to Aquaman? I mean, the resemblance is uncanny. Well, a more common misconception is that the fish relates to the miracle of the multitude, the biblical event where Jesus fed a crowd of thousands of people with just a few loaves of bread and some fish. However, that's not exactly where the faithful fish comes from. After all, that wouldn't explain why this mysterious word sometimes appears inside it. It looks like it says, Ixoye, but those are ancient Greek letters which sound more like ichthys. To understand this, we need to head back once again to ancient Rome. The Romans weren't big fans of Jesus or Christianity. They had their own gods and ways of doing things. As such, early Christians were persecuted in Rome. The fish was a secret symbol used by Christians, often found in catacombs and alleys, or temporarily in the dirt, signifying secret Christian meeting spots. This is because the ancient Greek word for fish is ichthys, which was an anagram for the word for Jesus at the time. The thought process was that the link was tenuous enough that the authorities wouldn't associate them with one another. The Ixoye is more debated. Some claim it's a corrupted version of Ictus, which has occurred over the centuries. Others believe it's a secret message. The letters standing for Lasaus, Christos, Theo, Ios, Sotar. In Greek, this would mean Jesus, Christ, Son of God, Savior. Hmm, I don't know. Seems a little fishy to me. Christ at Yahoo.com I think we can all agree without the at sign, all our email addresses would look super weird. What would we use instead? The hash sign? The percentage sign? The... I don't even know what that is. A pill crow? Huh? I didn't even know it had a name. Wait, I'm getting sidetracked. The at sign. While we couldn't live without it today, have you ever wondered where the little swirly A came from? Well, believe it or not, this very modern symbol has a very old origin. Before the advent of the printing press in 1436, and for a little while after too, the easiest way to create a copy of books was to do so by hand. Though it sounds agonizing, this was the task many monks across Europe undertook throughout the early medieval era. If abbeys were wealthy enough, some would have entire halls, called scriptoriums, dedicated to the practice. As you can imagine, copying out an entire book requires a lot of ink, so it was wise to use it sparingly. As such, monks occasionally used an A with a little circle around it instead of having to write the word at. In addition to saving a little ink, it was also a little easier on the wrist. The first use of the at sign outside this setting can be traced back to a letter written by Florentine merchant Francisco Lapi, all the way back in 1536. I wonder if he was a Gmail or Yahoo guy. Now think about this. What do you do when you're on public transport, cleaning your house, or you generally just can't stare at a screen? Do you still want to learn amazing facts and have your mind blown? Well, I've got the solution. 
Be Amazed is now available in podcast form. Look up Be Amazed on all major podcast platforms. Follow us now on the podcast platform of your choice, and you'll have the chance to win $500 of Amazon vouchers. We're giving $100 vouchers away to five lucky winners. All you need to do is slide into my DMs on Facebook or Instagram with a screenshot showing that you follow the Be Amazed podcast and left a top rating. Hurry, the competition ends on the 30th of September. Winners will be chosen at random and announced via our Facebook page. Well, did you learn something new? Or do you know the origins of a symbol that I didn't mention? Let me know down in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching.